All right, there we go. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? I hope I haven't been talking to myself. All right, thanks, Wakanda. The um, I'm just gonna go read through the fragment, the first page in that uh, in that tweet in the nest. Nor is it divisible, since it all alike is. Nor is it somewhat more here, which would keep it from holding together. Nor is it somewhat less, but it is all full of what is. Therefore, it is all continuous, for what is, is in contact with what is. Moreover, chain changeless in the limits of great chains, is unbeginning and unceasing, since coming to be and perishing have been driven far off, and true trust has thrust them out. Remaining the same and in the same, it lies by itself and remains thus firmly in place. For strong necessity holds it fast in the chains of a limit, which fences it about. Wherefore, it is not right for what is to be incomplete. For it is not lacking, but if it were, it would lack everything. All right, that's the, the first page there in the nest. And I'm going to start uh, my own observations from, you see the number 25 on the page where it says, therefore, it is all continuous. For what is, is in contact with what is. Now, without rehashing what we did in the prior spaces, I think I learned my lesson about doing that. The um, This is actually a very interesting line here. So, therefore, it is all continuous. For what is, is in contact with what is. We see this same sort of thought in fragment six, right? Um, no, not fragment six, fragment five it should be. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Ah, here we go, fragment four. Because what, what did we read in fragment four? It said, uh, look upon things which, though far off, are yet firmly present to the mind. For you shall not cut off what is from holding fast to what is. So in fragment four, we have this same sort of idea where what is holds fast or is connected to and cannot be cut off from the rest of what is. So it's like existence is all interconnected and inseparable from, from itself. And what's interesting about fragment four is also it doesn't seem to rule out spatiality. Actually, it seems that Parmenides is accepting some sort of spatiality, right? Because he's saying, Look upon things which, though far off, are yet firmly present to the mind. We have to... Okay, so... Things are all present to the mind because all things are inseparable from each other. You shall not cut off what is from holding fast to what is. But he's still saying that some things are far off. So presumably this language about being far off needs to have some, you know, it's, it needs to offer something meaningful. And so I think this would be an interesting line if we're getting into a discussion about whether or not being has spatial dimensions or things can be at a distance from one another. Because in one sense he's saying, look, everything is interconnected to each other and firmly present to the mind. In fragment four and in fragment eight, the line we read, what is, is in contact with what is. So it's all in contact and inseparable, and you think of it, and there it is. That's a mixture of fragment four and uh, that line from fragment eight. But all the same, things can still be far off, because again, in fragment four, it says, look upon things which, though far off, are yet firmly present to the mind. So this interconnected nature of, of being, or the fact that everything relates to everything else and is connected to everything else, I don't think we should read it as ruling out uh, spatial dimensions and spatial distance because clearly in fragment four he's making the same point as that line in fragment eight as far as I'm concerned but he's acknowledging that look even though it's all interconnected um, it can be far off in a spatial sense just don't take that spatial sense as meaning that something is disconnected or separated because all is connected to all um, and of course, that line starts with, therefore, it is all continuous. And sticking with my 
with my rule for this space that I'm not going to go over and rehash what we did last space and the space before that. Again, we wind up getting, we just wind up repeating ourselves or actually it wound up with some very good discussions, but it'll, we'll never get through this fragment if I do that. Um, if you want to say, if you want to see why he's saying therefore it is all continuous, the prior space did mention uh, divisibility and the impossibility of a outright division. Um, so the prior spaces do relate to this line here. But yeah, so I think that's the point being made here. Basically, everything is connected to everything else. Because again, if there's only being, if there just is what is, then everything we say has to be part of or, or of or subsumed by what is. And if all things are, are in what is, then they're all common to each other. They're all connected. They're all related in that unifying context. Um, so then we get the... Um, and also, of course, continuous, it means there's no gaps in it, right? Because, again, this is a point we keep revisiting about... Parmenides doesn't use the word void, uh, at least off the top of my head, I don't believe he ever mentions void. Um, but there's no, like, a gaps of nothingness that could separate one piece of what is from another piece of what is, right? Because if all we have is existence, or what is, or what can be pointed at, then there is no alternative substance or nothingness that could split it apart, right? It's not like we have a wedge that we can drive into what is, and the wedge is something other than what is, and thereby spoil its continuity or its um, homogeneity on the point of existence. Um, so it has to be continuous, right? And again, this whole fragment eight is about all the necessary inferences that we can draw from there just being what is. And so if there is just what is, then it has to be continuous because there's nothing that could break it up. And what is, is in contact with what is, which is meaningful in the sense that, well, if that, it's especially important for the reason we were just saying, but also it's a, this is also identifying a sort of plurality, right? For what is, is in contact with what is. That sentence or that clause to mean anything Again, my interest is in making this a Parmenides of meaning, a Parmenides where all possible meaning is present in the whole. Well, what is, is in contact with what is, presumes that, that there is more to, there, there are at least two things in what is that could be um, can, in contact with each other, right? Or there has to be more to it. There has to be some sort of substantial being or presence to, to what is uh, for us to say that what is over here is connected to what is over there. So I think this line can also be marshaled against those who will outright deny any sort of um, complex detail to being. Because, you know, how can what is be in contact with what is if, um, if what is cannot be used in two different senses here? Or two different to refer to two different details. And again, how could we read fragment four going back look upon things which, though far off, are yet firmly present to the mind if we're not having a, um, if we're not saying that what is is meaningful or has a lot of meaning or details in it that can be compared and maybe they all interrelate but relate differently to each other. Like an object is spatially far away from me, like the moon, but it's firmly present to my mind. I just say the moon and we're all thinking of it. Anyway, um, so we go to the next line. Moreover, changeless in the limits of great chain chains that language about chains here you know the um on the prior page in fragment eight justice is not allowing generation or perishing you know she's we've essentially said that change cannot involve new things that are not coming to be and what is perishing or becoming what is not um and so if we deny this sense of generation where what is not now is, and we deny that what is can, can become what is not, um, these are the shackles uh, or the chains that justice is holding or necessity is holding being in place with. This is why being is changeless because there's nothing that is not that could now come to be and what is could not become something else. Um, for the arguments that were previously given, we're not going to review them all, but those are the shackles that were previously mentioned in fragment eight 
And so I'm guessing that right now, this reference of changeless in the limits of great chains, is just a reference to that earlier part of fragment eight. So again, moreover, changeless in the limits of great change, chains, it is unbeginning and unceasing, since coming to be and perishing have been driven far off, and true trust has thrust them out. So yeah, it's just a reference again uh, to the arguments that were just given in fragment eight earlier about how change is, you know, it's incoherent, it's nonsense. Now, again, as we've always said in these discussions, we have to preserve some sort of relative change because Parmenides is telling us a story about a youth who hops on a chariot and goes through these gates that justice opens for him and then sits down with a goddess, right? But at the same time, it cannot be an absolute sense of change because generation and perishing have been thrust out, so to speak. And so those are the those are the chains being referenced there. It's just basically saying being is unchanging. And it's a rather poetic way of doing it. And why is it unchanging? Well, necessity. Remaining the same and in the same, it lies by itself and remains thus firmly in place. For strong necessity holds it fast in the chains of a limit which fences it about. Well, again, yeah, it's, um, if it can't change, if there's no new things coming to be and no old things passing away, then yes, it would remain the same and in the same. It would lie by itself. It would just be where it is, as it is, by itself. And again, if it, if there is, if there just is what is, it is solitary because there's no other thing to posit on the other side of it or against it or next to it. So it's solitary, it lies by itself, and it remains the same and in the same because we've banished generation and becoming. I mean, no, gen generation and perishing. So, yeah, remaining the same and in the same because change is gone. Lying by itself because what is is all there is, and so it is solitary. Firmly in place. Again, of course, firmly in place because it's not going anywhere because it's not changing. And uh, for strong necessity holds it fast in the chains of a limit, which fences it about. Again, it's a lot of poetic language there, but again, another reference to chains, which we saw earlier in fragment eight and earlier on this page. Just it's just it's a necessary inference of there only being one thing. It's really showing, I think, that all of these things that Parmenides or the goddess is saying in this fragment are necessary and undeniable inferences from there being one thing, being or what is. It's interesting that it says, um, holds it fast in the chains of a limit, which fences it about. Fences it about. I don't know how far we would want to endorse fencing it about. Um, because it's almost as though what would a fence, what purpose does a fence serve? It's, I suppose, to keep something in and not let something go outside which would assume that there is an outside, right? But this poem of Parmenides is really not positing an outside. For if we have what is, and that is the, the whole story, then it's not really in a fence because it's not being, there's no boundary hemming it in of which there is something on the other side. But in the sense that we can say that because there just is what is, then yes, it's complete, and it is no more or less than what it is. And so in that sense, yes, I can see why we might say it's fenced in, because it just is what it is, no more, no less, and it cannot grow to be more, and it cannot shrink to be less. So it is chained uh, by necessity in its limit. But its limit is just what it is. And I suppose I, I, I go into a... I would have a lot of words to say about that line because there's another Eleatic Melissus, right, who is going to say that being or what is, is not limited. It's aperon. And why would uh, Melissus say that? Well, um, you know, we can try to interpret it, but what he would be saying is, and I don't have the fragment in front of me here, I should pull it up actually, but if there just is what is, how are we describing a boundary? Is a boundary to have another object resting against it or hemming it in? And therefore, if there just is what is, 
it is not limited by anything else. For then there would be more than one thing, right? And so you could say that what is is unlimited because there's nothing beyond it. There's nothing it can't grasp or doesn't reach. And there's nothing hemming it in or constraining it because it is all that is. And so therefore it is unlimited because there are no limits being placed upon or weighing against it. Um, and I don't see Parmenides here as saying, or the goddess as saying anything that would necessarily contradict that. But that language about being fenced about, at least in the translation, is a little um, is a little too po poetic, maybe for my tastes. But I can I can see what he's saying. It's like it is what it is, no more, no less, and it's not going to grow or shrink. So it's in this limit of just being what it is. And therefore, he says. Um, Wherefore, it is not right for what is to be incomplete, for it is not lacking, but if it were, it would lack everything. That's really interesting. Um, earlier in fragment eight, um, and again, I'm tr really trying to avoid <laughs> backtracking because we're making good progress through this fragment right now even though it's just kind of like my stream of thought of what I think about it. But the um, earlier in fragment eight, what we saw is this very same line, but given to um, to creation and destruction. Yeah, here we go. Fragment eight, the first page in the uh, David Gallup's translation, the Phoenix Pre-Socratics version. I'm, I'm going to think it's probably in the sixth n space number six that we did. But the um, here we go. In what way whence did it grow? Neither from what is not shall I allow you to say or think. For it is not to be said or thought that it is not. And what need could have impelled it to grow later or sooner, if it began from nothing? Thus it must either be completely or not at all. So look at that last line. Thus it must either be completely or not at all. Because he's saying, look, there's no creation and there's no destruction. It's just going to be what there is. And you're not going to add to it and you're not going to subtract to it. And so if there just is what is and it doesn't grow and it doesn't shrink, then it's all there. And if it's not all there, well, then nothing's there. Because there's no, there's no basis for it to be partially there. And if it's not all there, then it's not going to come to be because we banish generation. So it must either be completely or not at all. And then we come over here to where we're actually reading today. Wherefore, it is not right for what is to be incomplete, for it is not lacking. But if it were, it would lack everything. So I think we can draw a direct line between those two points. The first one that I read out there was about if there's no generation or destruction, then what is, is what there is, and it's not going to be added to or subtracted. And so if it's there, it's all there. And if it's not there, well, there's no basis for it to be partially there, and it just wouldn't be there at all. And you couldn't add to it, so it's not at all, which doesn't make any sense, right? So it's just, it's either there completely or not at all. It can't be not at all, so therefore it's there completely. And here we have what's there is complete, for it's not lacking, and if it is lacking, it would lack everything. And so, it is not right for it to be incomplete because, as we heard in uh, section 7 of these spaces and 6, we've already banished the idea of division. Uh, we've already banished the idea of generation and perishing. And we've indicated that what is is tied up in great chains, so it's unchanging and it, it's there by itself and it's fully complete. And now if we come down here and say, well, it might be lacking something. I this, The poem has sort of not given us any way to say that it could be lacking something because it's alone and it's all that is. And so for it to be lacking something, there has to be something that it lacks. But we have nowhere to place that lack. We have nowhere to place this other thing that it would not have. And so if we say that it is lacking, I suppose then something has fundamentally been broken in this model. And whatever would cause it to lack that other thing, I suppose would cause it to lack everything, right? It's like what, if we say, if we cast this net of being and we say, this is all there is, there is what there is. And then 
that's all there is to reality. It's just, there is what there is. That's the whole picture. And everything we have to say is within that context. And then someone comes along and says, oh, you're lacking something. It's like, well, how could it be lacking something? There's no, there's, there's no possible explanation or coherent reason it could be lacking something. And so if you're just going to say it lacks something, then by the same basis, namely to say there is no real reason, you could say it lacks everything. So, oh, well, it lacks something. It lacks um, screwdrivers. All right. Well, by the same, like there's no reason to say it lacks screwdrivers. So whatever caused you to say that could cause you to say it lacked anything. And so we've already said it's complete. And if you're going to say it's incomplete, despite there being no reason or cause for it to lack anything at all, then you may as well just say it lacks everything, is how I would sort of take that that line there. And so we have to accept that being is absolutely complete. And if we are trying to tamper with that, well, then it has to lack everything because if it lacks one thing, it may as well lack it all because there's no distinguishing reason why it would lack one thing rather than another. And, and most importantly, of course, um, it's also a sort of rhetorical point or question, right? Because it's absurd to say it lacks something. If this is everything, how could it lack something? It is everything by definition, so it couldn't lack. That's amazing. We have gotten through the first page of this. <laughs> yeah, again, if anyone wants the mic or anything like that, please raise your hand, but we're tearing through this, which is, again, I, I'm very happy about because this has always been a bit of a casual space with no detailed preparation, but the... Um, but, but these fragments are so dense and have so much to discuss. And the ramifications are so significant. And um, I mean, they're extremely significant for everything we have to say about metaphysics and religion and many topics that um, usually I've been finding we can get through maybe one sentence and, and then a, a big discussion breaks out and, and we cannot progress through the fragment, um, which is good in its own way, a lot of quality discussions. But... But it also means that I think we have like maybe two, three hours on fragment eight and we, we barely got through in some of the spaces we've actually regressed. The um, pronoun, I uh, took to you the mic. Feel free to uh, speak up. Any observations, uh, questions, anything you want to say, feel free to join in. Yeah, I just had a quick question. So when you were discussing how being was hemmed in or by a fence, would you maybe describe that as all possibilities exist within it and no possibilities exist without it? Yeah, I mean, that's one way to to um, to describe it. I mean, what is when do we first encounter the chains, right? So, again... I guess is you know what my my idea of not backtracking is not really possible because this and I even I violated that myself and I went to fragment four earlier in the space, but the um, when when do we first encounter the chains in uh, fragment eight? We encounter them when uh, here we go. Therefore, neither coming to be nor perishing has justice allowed, relaxing her shackles, but she holds it fast. The decision about these matters depends on this, is or is not, but it has been decided, as is necessary, to let go the one is unthinkable, unnameable, and to allow the other so that it is and is true. Now, I go back to that space because you just said, is it fenced in because everything is within it, essentially, like all the possibilities are within it. The um, We have to ask, why are there shackles why is it being held fast and i i read this shackles holding fast uh, and then later limits of great chain chains um chains of a limit fences it about i refer i i take all this language to be referring to the same sort of idea of necessity that it is how it is and so why why are we saying that it's in shackles and being held fast well, the first time it happens is because there's no such thing as coming to be. Like, there's no new state that will come to be and cause what is to change into something else. And there is no um, there is no perishing. It, it doesn't fade away and die either. Both in Parmenides and in Melissus, being or what is does not degenerate into, I guess, the incoherent idea of nothing. And it doesn't come to be something else. So that's why it's in shackles. Now, you mentioned possibility. And 
you can of course speak more to what you mean by possibility there but if we mean it in terms of uh, possible things that will occur in a timeline or something like that yeah we've already established that being there's nothing new coming to be and there's nothing old passing away so to the extent that we speak of possibility it has to be there within what is right um and so the fence you know possibility and all the other meaning is within the fence but the fence is almost just a sense of saying it's stability right it doesn't it doesn't flow outside of what it is because it is complete and unchanging and so yes any possibilities would be inside the fence but but in talking about a fence and in talking about chains i think that the parmenides is using poetic language to talk about the necessity of being remaining what it is as it is how it is uh and and being unchanging just like a fence would keep something where it is and chains might hold something from going elsewhere uh, but actually philosophically like to speak just in plain language the reason why there are chains the reason why there's a fence there's the reason of it all is that it's omnipresent it's all subsuming so there is nowhere else it could go so it's not like you need to be chained or you need to be fenced because whether there are chains or whether there are a fence it doesn't matter because there's nowhere else to go there only is what is and so that's my issue with the poetic language of chains and fences but i appreciate the poetic language in the sense that yeah it, it's showing that it that it stays where it is it stays put because it's complete and perfect and there's nowhere else for it to go um so that's you know that's my thinking on it uh, does it make sense to you yes yeah it, it does so you might if i might correct my statement say all possibilities are fully fulfilled within being or are kind of completed within it at all times that might be a better way of stating that yeah absolutely because what is the um well i suppose this is again there are many interpretations of parmenides i can't pretend to to be the only interpreter or exegete i can't even pretend to be the greatest exegete i don't even speak ancient greek but the um if there is just one core teaching of is like affirmative existence then yes everything we have to talk about all meaning that we can communicate to each other it all has to be within that core teaching of is and again to flip back to the uh, the proem fragment one if we go to the end of it what does a goddess say she's going to teach us she's going to teach us the steadfast heart of persuasive truth which i interpret as existence or what is and then um she's also going to learn she's also going to teach us the beliefs of mortals uh, and her last line of fragment one is well this is a little bit more than the last line but here we go how the things which seem had to have genuine existence permeating all things completely and so in my interpretation of course um the things which seems things which theme is going to be what you mentioned you know all meaning or possibility all that could be uh like oh there's a fire over there there's water over there i had a nice day today you know all that all the meaningful stuff in the world even ourselves they have to have genuine existence that is to say they have to be on that they have to be part of that steadfast heart of persuasive truth they have to be contained in that um so yeah so what is is essentially perfectly complete reality is perfectly complete and because reality is perfectly complete all of these arguments that we're seeing in fragment eight are necessary conclusions or necessary inferences uh which again is is the term necessity um or anagki or whatever is you know throughout this poem here and um and and language like chains and fences and and being held in place and whatever by justice and necessity um that sort of language i think reinforces the interpretation i have if that makes sense to you all right so um well where are we? so we go oh so you mentioned that it all has to exist at once right and so i think we saw that uh not in the last space but the space before again it's um fragment eight but uh part of that discussion where the goddess was um ruling out generation and perishing we see here we go nor was it once nor will it be 
since it is now altogether one continuous. For what coming to be of it will you seek? In what way? Whence did it grow? And so on and so forth. But that, that language right there, I think, is relevant to something you said just now, which is, nor was it once, nor will it be, since it is now altogether. There are a few competing interpretations of how to read that or interpret that, but I interpret it in a way that I think you said, which is, it's not that there's a past that's separated or, or disconnected from the present and then a future that will then come to be, but rather the entire chronology exists altogether in, a, in sort of an eternal now. So even though I, I will accept that there's a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and a Thursday, all those moments in time or all those details, they all exist side by side in this completed now or completed eternal time frame. Um, so yeah, so that is also in fragment eight, a point about, you know, it's not that it once existed, it's not that it will come to come to exist, uh, but rather it exists perfectly complete as a whole, continuous, completed, all together. All right, what do we got here? And again, anyone else wants to uh, make their own observations or their own interpretations or anything, feel free to request a mic. There's no... Um, I'm happy to, to read through this and get through it, um, but if anyone has anything to add, they should definitely feel free to speak up. All right, we're going to go to page two. Here we go. So in that, um, in the nest, you see there are two pages up there. Page two is the same thing is for thinking and is that there is thought. For not without what is, on which it depends, having been declared, will you find thinking. For nothing else is or will be besides what is. Since it was just this that fate did shackle to be whole and changeless. Wherefore it has been named all things that mortals have established, trusting them to be true, to come to be and to perish, to be and not to be, and to shift place and to exchange bright color. Now there's a number of points in the fragments and we've, we've encountered a couple of them where this connection between thinking and being, um, this point is explored. Uh, obviously we'll, we'll focus on this one in fragment eight, but if we go back in the text, um, here we go. I think it's like fragment six, is it? Yeah, fragment six at the beginning we have. It must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is, for it is there to be. Whereas nothing is not, that is what I bid you consider. So this is, a, again, it's sort of establishing the omnipresence or all subsuming nature of what is, um, including over any, like basically anything you can speak or think about. Um, but also we have... Um, Fragment three is a famous one. It's the, uh, because the same thing is there for thinking and for being. And of course, we had a lot of alternative translations for that when we did the space in that fragment. For example, the, uh, for it is the same thing that can be thought and that can be. For the same thing can be thought as can be. Ascertaining and being real are one and the same. You know, there, there are many, many different translations in English here. And, and to be clear, actually, for Fragment 8, there are sections in Fragment 8 where the Ancient Greek as well is actually in multiple different versions. Like, um, you know, off the top of my head, if we go back to Fragment 8, we have the whole, single-limbed, steadfast, and complete right at the beginning there. The um, That line about um, being single-limbed and whatnot, I think there's like four different versions of it. I Again, I'm not the, the scholar of Ancient Greek. I don't want to get into that per se, um, because I'm of course trying to interpret it in a way where I myself am accepting this as the truth, right? And and I think the goddess is right, and however it was written down by the youth or written down by Parmenides is, is secondary really to the philosophical discussion and, and conclusions themselves, but, but yeah, just be aware that um, where we see here in fragment eight, the same thing is for thinking and that there is thought, that line of connecting like our ability to think and being is explored in uh, fragment, again, fragment six, um, fragment three we had there. Um, should be another place too, actually. 
I want to say in Fragment 2 somewhere. Maybe not. Well, anyway. But here in Fragment 8, what do we have? We say the same thing is for thinking and that there is thought. For not without what is, on which it depends, having been declared, will you find thinking. For nothing else is or will be besides what is. The same thing is for thinking and that there is thought. I view this from two different angles. One is, of course, to say the same point that was being made over in fragment six, which is essentially, look, if you're thinking about stuff, if you're speaking about stuff, then it is, for it is there to be thought of. So if you're talking about ghosts and unicorns and like um, Dyson spheres and whatever other thing we want to talk about, the uh, it is something. Like how can you d distinguish a ghost from a unicorn? There's some sort of affirmative meaning or presence there. We're thinking about something. It's there to be thought of. It's not nothing. It's not a non-existent. We could categorize it differently from the computer on my table if we had some sort of model of reality, like a physical model that we wanted to run with. But, But I think the point is essentially, you don't have thought without what is. For not without what is, on which it depends, having been declared, will you find thinking. So to the extent that we can think, to the extent that we can talk about anything, all of that content, all of that meaning, everything we communicate or recognize or grasp, it's subsumed by this omnipresent isness or what is. There's this all-encompassing sense of is or what is. And he's saying that thinking depends on that. And whatever you find to think about is there in what is. And again, what is is that perfectly complete um, whole. But also the um, that there is thought. The same thing is for thinking and is that there is thought. And then I guess we can go down to an alternative translations here in the screenshot. You can see them. The, um, here we go. And the same is to think of, and wherefore is the thinking, for not without what is, to which it stands committed, will you find thinking. That's yeah, the same point we were just discussing. It is the same to think, and the thought that the object of thought exists, for without being, in what has been expressed, you will not find thought. Again, that's the same thing we, that I was saying. The thing that can be thought, and that for the sake of which the thought exists, is the same. For you cannot find thought without something that is, as to which it is uttered. Mm, this is an interesting translation in the sense that we'd have to get into a discussion of whether you can have a thought without content, I suppose. But another way of reading this whole thing is to recognize that that there's something wrong with the idea of, of um, not just wrong with the sense of saying, I'm thinking of something that doesn't exist. Okay, obviously the clear, plain reading of this fragment, fragment six and elsewhere, is that if you are grasping some sort of meaning, that meaning has affirmative presence, it does exist in this broader sense. But also, if we're having a discussion of thought, like we're, we're thinking about thought, you know, the thinking itself also is subsumed by what is. It's not like we're, it's not like we can be outside of being, thinking about being. It's like, no, it's all taking place in being. The thought and the thinking is being as well. Now, whether that reading can be attached to this section, this particular section, I guess I'd have to go through some of these alternative translations and think about it more. But overall, of course, if we are something, then we are within what is, right? And so not just the objects of our thought, but thinking itself is going to be part of being or subsumed by being. Now, of course, you have the um, interpretations of Parmenides where all is thought. Um, that's not necessarily mine, although if someone wants to come up with a, uh, a model of reality where everything can be resolvable to thoughts, good luck to them, I guess. But if they could do that, then maybe that's uh, to equate thought with being would then be okay. But 
But essentially what I'm getting from this is, one, whatever you're thinking about, it exists. And two, just the whole thing about thought and thinking, it itself exists. This process exists. It depends on what is. And you find it within what is. And you yourself are within what is. So all of thought, all of its objects, it's all in there with what is. And at no point are you ever going to think about something other than what is. And at no point are you... Like what does Archimedes say? You know, if I was on another planet, I could use a lever to move this one. At no point are you in another place outside of being, thinking about being. Your thoughts are here in being and depend on this context. It is in within this context. Let me say, um, for nothing else is or will be besides what is. Since it was just this, that fate did shackle to be whole and changeless. Okay, great. So that, that again goes to this point. There's nothing else besides what is. So therefore thinking, thought, minds, whatever. It's, it's in what is, right? Because there's nothing else is or will be besides what is. So wherever we find thinking, thought, whatever, it all has to be there and what is. And again, it's a, it's a reference to those shackles or fences or chains. Um, because fate did shackle to be whole and changeless. Because again, if there just is what there is, then it's complete because there's nothing else beyond it. There just is what is. And it's changeless for the reasons that we cast out generation and perishing. Wherefore, it has been named all things that mortals have established, trusting them to be true. To come to be and to perish, to be and not to be, and to shift place and to exchange bright color. So of course, these these things here the, that mortals have established is probably going to be interpreted as a reference to the path of seeming, right? It's going to be going to that discussion of the path of seeming. But I think we have to go back to fragment two here to understand, I mean, any interpretation of Parmenides is going to have to answer what do you think the relationship is between truth and the path of seeming? And my interpretation is in large part informed by my interpretation of the ending of fragment one which is of course the things which seem and again what's it up here well if, we'll go back to fragment one first the things which seem had to have genuine existence so i'm saying that the uh all the things that mortals have established that is going to be found in or spoken of or subsumed by what is, namely the truth, you know, what is reality writ large. And so when it says here, you know, nothing else is or will be besides what is. There's just what there is. And then it says, what is is whole and changeless. And then it says, wherefore it has been named all things that mortals have established. Depending on, again, there are a couple of different translations that take it in a different direction depending on how you want to interpret it but my preferred interpretation here will obviously be that all things that mortals mortals have established um, are, are effectively names of being right wherefore it has been named all things that mortals have established that is to say all the things all the meaning that we mortals communicate that we're aware of that we experience all of that being has been named that because you know all that stuff that we're communicating has to what's it about it's about being because there is nothing else besides being it just is whole and changeless being or what is and so all the things we name those names all attach to being to come to be and to perish to be and not to be to shift place and to exchange bright color you know there's going to be a discussion about to what extent those those names or those descriptions or those phrases or models cohere to what extent they offer meaning but to the extent they have any meaning they're names of what is or they attach to what is um and i think depending on what weight we can give the wherefore there it's like how what what, what interpretation can we give the wherefore there and again what interpretation do i want to give the wherefore there again trying to keep this philo philosophical tradition alive and i think it's correct it's essentially saying look there's nothing else besides what is wherefore all the names attached to it 
Because if they attach to anything, there's only one thing for them to attach to. What is? Um, so yeah, so I think that that section there can be read in line with the last section of fragment one and it's going to continue to subsume the path of seeming within the path of truth and make sure that we wind up with a, a view of reality that is perfectly complete sort of this perfectly complete metaphysical entity that it's alone and changeless and contains all possible meaning and that's sort of the view of the world that that's what reality is that is what there is and everything we say is is right there in it just like we are and that is the end of this section. The, um, you know, just for a few minutes, this, this last bit here, it reminds me of a section from Melissus. So we're going to pull up a copy of Melissus here. I'll do it quickly. I think I have one on my computer here. Let me type in uh, Melissus, Melissus text. Because what does Melissus say about these things, this... Um, Come to be and to perish, to be and not to be, shift place and to exchange bright color. He says much, well, we'll see if he says the same thing. I believe it will be read as the same thing. It's right at the end of the, uh, right at the end of his essay. One of the last fragments here. Here we go. Uh, he says, if there is earth, water, air, fire, iron, and gold, and one thing living and another dead, and black and white, and all the things people say are real. If indeed there are these things, and we see and hear correctly, each of these must be just as it seemed to us, and they cannot change or become different in quality, but each must always be as it is. Okay, so that's the first bit I want to read. Why do I want to read that bit? Because he's saying, look, Earth, water, air, fire, iron, gold, the living and the dead, the black and the white, anything that we talk about that's real. If indeed these things are real, and of course they have to be if we perceived them, if we experienced them, there's no other category for them to be in, then they cannot, they, they essentially they're going to have to comply with being. That's actually the, uh, the last line of the fragment, right? It's, um, therefore, if there were many, they ought to be of just the same sort as the one is. The one here I'm equating with Parmenides being or what is. So he's saying, you know, if we have earth, water, air, fire, living, dead, etc. And they're real. Like if we really, if, if we have perceived something, if there are these things. They ought to be of just the same sort as the one is. They have to be the same as the one. They have to comply with the nature of what is. Namely, all these details. They have to comply with the context of being or the one. They can't change. Nothing can happen to them. So Parmenides in this section is saying, to come to be and to perish, to be and not to be, to shift place and to exchange bright color. These are the things that the models have established, right? That they're saying of being. And so Melissa also explores this. And in my interpretation, the mortals who, um, who talk of coming to be and perish and perishing, and uh, to be and not to be and all this stuff, to the extent they're communicating any meaning, it the meaning complies with the nature of being or what is. And to the extent that they that there's a contradiction, they've just failed to communicate any meaning. And so here we say, um, this is Melissa's section that's going to read similarly. It says, it seems to us that what is hot becomes cold, and what is cold hot. What is hard becomes soft, and what is soft hard. The living dies and comes to be from what is not living. All these things alter, and that what they were and what they are now are in no way homogeneous. It seems that iron, though hard, is rubbed away when it comes into contact with a finger. And so too gold and stone and everything else that seems to be strong so that it follows that we neither see nor recognize what is, and that earth and stone come to be from water. So these things do not agree with each other, for we say that there are many things that are eternal, and have their own forms and strength, and yet it seems to us that they all alter in quality, and change from how they are each time they are seen. Therefore, clearly, we have not seen correctly, nor do these things correctly seem to be many, for they would not change if they were real but each thing would be just as it seemed to be, for nothing is stronger than what is real, 
but being changed, what is is destroyed, what is not has come to be. Therefore, if there were many, they ought to be of just the same sort as the one is. So again, he's saying, if fire, earth, air, water, whatever is real, it has to be just like the one is. It has to be just like being. It has to comply with that context. And again, that's what I read from the goddess in the end of fragment one and I believe in this section of fragment eight, which is, look, to the extent that the mortals name anything, it's of being. To the extent that there's a way of seeming and it involves meaning, it has to have genuine existence. It's it's on the path of truth. It, it is part of what is. And then Parmenides is saying here, Look, coming to be and to perish, to be and not to be, to shift place, to exchange bright color. And Melissus is saying, you know, the living de dying and then coming to be, and the soft becoming hard and the hard and the um, and the hard becoming soft. These changes, and they're identifying that as a problem because these, um, I guess, phenomena or these these changes, they're not complying with the nature of the one or the nature of being. And so, how do we interpret that? I would interpret it as the mortals, or this way of speaking, is actually incoherent, and the words don't communicate meaning beyond a certain point. It's like the words communicate meaning to the point that there are colors, or bright colors. There are places to be. Um, there is earth and stone. There is iron and gold. There is living and dead. To that extent, the, the the names that the models give per this Parmenides line or what we see and hear and grasp per Melissus, that's real, that's true. But the meaning breaks off when when the speaker or the, the mortal fails to recognize um, that there is nothing stronger than what is real and what is real cannot be changed, cannot be destroyed. And so their words sort of fall apart and sort of fall into contradiction, really. To say that what is hot became what is cold, you can say that in a relative sense. You could say, like, the fire is burning on Monday, uh, but it's ashes on Tuesday. Okay, yeah, you have fire on Monday, and you have ashes on Tuesday. But the fire on Monday is always the fire on Monday, and it's always there. And the ashes on Tuesday are always the ashes on Tuesday, and they're always there. And they exist permanently, sort of invincibly, in their own right, where they are as what they are. And that is what Melissus is saying right there at the end, right? For they would not change if they were real, but each thing would be just as it seemed to be, for nothing is stronger than what is real. Because it just is what there is, as it is, how it is, with the impossibility, due to the being held in chains or fenced in, of, of changing to anything else. And so sort of an eternalist and indestructible model of reality. But I think that, that those sections from Melissus and this section here with Parmenides and with reference back to the end of Fragment 1 is, is an interesting topic. I think it's, it's an attempt to show how the path of seeming is to be interpreted or how the claims of mortals and our experiences are to be interpreted. They have to be interpreted as real, because, of course, we all have it, and we're telling a story about a youth on a chariot going to speak with the goddess. Or with Melissus, we're talking about iron being rubbed away with a finger. But the, um, but to the extent that we, we have these experiences, they have to be of just the same sort as the one is, the last line from Melissus. Or indeed, as, as Parmenides says here, being is named all things that models have established. It all has to be part of being. It all has to comply with the nature of being. And so I think that is the way to connect the path of seeming to the path of truth. And that is the end of the... Well, it's not even the eight, end of fragment 8. Fragment 8 goes for another one, two... Yeah, another two pages on fragment 8. But the uh, it's the end of the fr sections that I put up in the in the nest. The... Um, if anyone has any comments, feel free to jump in. Again, this, this space is um, its not really a, a lecture. I, I don't have any notes or anything that I'm reading off of here. I just have the book in my hand, and I opened up Melissa's fragments on my screen. But the um, So if anyone has anything to add or anything to say, feel free to jump in. Happy to discuss anything that we read today or anything else about the Eleatics, really. Uh, but otherwise, I'll probably call it a day. Oh, Pronom, yeah, feel free. Jump in.
So, quick question. I don't know if this is relevant, but so we have the kind of the metaphysical truth of being, which is absolute, and we have the realm of seeming, which is, you know, iron, metals, not, you know, living and dead, so on. How would you determine what might be, say, um, more true or more real in the realm of seeming? So, I might say, so I might say, that dog over there is a cat, and then I would say, no, it's a dog. I mean, would say daily addicts, you know, say, well, he's more correct than someone else. Yeah, I mean, to answer that question, we have to have a theory of of how things are described, I suppose, or how to compare statements with other things. Um, you know, I, I would start by saying, look, there's no question of something being more or less real, right? So... To the extent that we are equating the word truth with being, then there's no question of falsehood. Everything is true because everything is, right? Um, but what you're sort of pointing at is almost like a comparison. It's like um, we have a dog and then we have, you know, maybe your description of the dog and then my description of the dog. And maybe I'm saying, you know, the dog has whiskers and it's a feline. And you are saying, well, the dog is a canine and it doesn't have... Well, I don't know. Do dogs have whiskers? Yeah, I guess they do. Um, you know what I'm saying. Basically, well, do they have whiskers? I don't know. It's been a while since I... I don't have a dog anymore. But the... Um, essentially, what I'm getting at is we, we would have a system whereby we could say whose description is closer. Uh, because in the poem, like we saw... If we go back to fragment six, for example... What did we see in fragment six? It said, um, it must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is, for it is there to be. Okay, so we, we appreciate that there there is speaking and thinking in Parmenides' worldview. You have what is, and in that context, there is speaking and thinking. And what is spe what is spoken and thought of also is, you know, it's there to be. Um, it's there to be discussed. Um, and so we have a dog. And so essentially we have three things now. We have one, dog, two, my description of it, three, your description of it. And I suppose we would just be drawing um, almost like a distance. Like how, how well does the statement reflect that object? But each thing exists in its own right. I mean, my statement exists, your statement exists, the dog exists. At no point are we saying that anything doesn't exist. But we could say that your description is a is a better reflection or or is closer to the dog than my description, which is more distant or further away or is not a reflection of it. Um, but of course, going back to fragment four, right, they're all there together and they all exist because this is going to be fragment four and fragment eight. Look upon things which, though far off, are yet firmly present to the mind, for you shall not cut off what is from holding fast to what is. So obviously they are all connected you can't cut off what is from holding fast to what is um, so all our statements and the dog would all be there in what is um, and in fragment eight we see that this is a continuous whole it says therefore it is all continuous for what is is in contact with what is um, so again it the statements the dog it's all interrelated but i suppose we can make a distance reference and say that your statement is closer to the dog or your statement is more similar to the dog than than my statement which would be less similar or more distant and i don't think we have a problem with uh, positing a distance because again going to fragment four look upon things which though far off are yet firmly present to the mind so things can be far off or closer um depending on how how much weight fragment four can carry for us but relying on fragment four i don't think it i don't think we have a problem saying that within the context of being some things are closer and some things are further away fragment four obviously is going to be a uh, a spatial judgment i think is the proper reading of it but you know if we can have distance then we can also have distance in truth and my statement would be further away than than your statement from the uh, from the nature of the dog being described does that does that work for you or does that make sense to you oh i can't hear you Prune. i'm sorry um are you speaking or is my internet dying um oh there you are 
just trying to that with the fact that all these, these statements are inherently real as judgment, but some are closer. It seems a little contradictory thinking about it. Well, think of it this way. I mean, let's take it step by step. We have a dog as this spatial entity, right? Let's not use a dog. Let's just use a picture. We have a, a picture on the wall. It's like a spatial object, right, with shapes and colors. The um, And then we have the speaking or the thought of um, a description of a painting. And I have one and you have one. Are we Are we happy to say that all these things exist together in being? Like my description in words of a painting and your description of words in a painting and uh and then the painting on a wall that we're looking at can we can we draw that picture and be happy with it all existing together as a whole picture generally would agree that the, you know these are all different in terms of they exist um, but to the degree that would other um, yeah so, so, so I understand where you're in general I mean I suppose I could ask and I'm sorry if I'm cutting you off it's just roboting a bit I don't know if it's my connection or your connection or what's going on maybe it's Twitter's back end but the um, I suppose what um, what idea of um well, you know, we have to build a model of true and false, right? And so in this discussion of, um, let's say we say 1 plus 1 equals 2. And given a certain system, that's true. Um, and then we could say 1 plus 1 equals 3. And given that same system, we could say, no, that's false. We have to give the term false here a meaning. And it's not this, this true-false dichotomy is not, this it's 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 using the term true in a different way that we were using the term true to refer to what is because what is is all encompassing right so there's no alternative there's no separate thing beyond what is that could serve as a false in the metaphysical sense so now we're describing something else we're describing some sort of comparison or some sort of dichotomy and things can either be true or false. Or in a description of an object, I suppose they could be a close and accurate description. Or a uh, inaccurate description. Or it could be describing something totally different. You know, so to go back to the, the original one, which is a dog. It's like you could describe a dog and point to the dog on the street. And I could describe, I don't know, a T-Rex. And obviously I'm describing something totally different. Um, and so if we if we're to say like... Who is giving the true description? I mean, what does true mean there? True, like, to my my initial response would be, true is saying, like, which, which description or what sort of communicated meaning is closer to the dog? And what, and when we say, you know, which one is false, it's like, well, which one is, in our judgment, further away or, or less relevant or more distant? Or, to borrow the language from Fragment 4, far off. Um, although, again, I appreciate Fragment 4 is probably not trying to put forward a, uh, a system of, of logic or judging true and false statements. But, but here, we have to give true and false some meaning. And true just seems to be what is a close or accurate description. And false seems to be what is a, a description that doesn't really apply to the thing being pointed at. It, but it has to apply to something. I mean, otherwise it's just not meaningful. So there are T-Rexes, but but they're more distant or they're further away or they have nothing to do with the dog that's being pointed at. And so that's... All I can say is that, that is how I would interpret the scenario. It's like two guys point at a dog. The one whose description is closer, more resembles, more invokes the idea of the dog. That guy is true. And the one whose description is more distant, further away, appears to be talking about something else... That guy's false. Um, and I'm not, you know, I. that's how I'm interpreting it. Are you Are you looking at it differently, or did you have a different idea of true and false? No, I think that makes sense. I mean, I, I guess uh, now how it's, you might describe it is uh, correspondence. So you might say 
my idea or your idea of a dog corresponds better to the physical reality of the dog. But all, both ideas exist and are real. Um, these are just maybe, say, two different modes of being uh, one that corresponds better to physical reality, the other that corresponds worse. That might be how I describe in this case. Right. And the, um, you know, we had a discussion just to, I mean, you already, it's not like you're saying this is wrong, but the, um, we had a discussion about things being real. It's sort of, um, when we were speaking earlier about ghosts, for example, right? Ghosts and unicorns and things. The um, we, we looked at fragment, I want to say it was fragment 6 and that section in fragment 8. So fragment 6, it must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is, for it is there to be, whereas nothing is not. So of course, if we're speaking of something, like if I'm describing something, all the meaning I'm communicating, all the things I'm saying, they have to be there for me to think of. Um, and if we had that discussion, if we went back to that bit about the ghosts and the unicorn, it's like, well, we could say that ghosts and unicorns don't exist, but we would just mean that in a very limited physical sense, because obviously we can distinguish between a ghost and we can distinguish between a unicorn. They're both there to speak of per fragment six. They both have some affirmative content that they are in their own right. And we, and to say anything, we are speaking of them, not of nothing. Um, and of course in fragment 8 we had, uh, where is it, the same thing is for thinking and is there, and that is, the, oh, this, this grammar on this translation, the same thing is for thinking and is that there is thought, for not without what is, on which it depends, having been declared, will you find thinking. For nothing else either is or will be besides what is. Okay, so essentially if we're talking about something or thinking about something, uh, it depends on what is because there's nothing other than what is. And if we're thinking of something, it has to be there in what is. Um, that's kind of me being long-winded because you didn't say anything, I think, that that contradicts that at all. It just, I just want to make extra clear to myself maybe that the thoughts, the descriptions, and the dog and all of it, it all has to be affirmative content. So I don't ever want to get into a situation where we say that your description of the dog is true and my description is not close, it's not like it's not like an accurate version of the dog and therefore it's nothing. It has no correspondent in reality. I don't want to be in that situation because whatever description I put forward, to the extent that it coheres, it's just as real as your description. And it may or may not be close to the dog but it's still meaningful and still exists um, but yeah uh, ancient uh, it's good to see you I have to say um, I went I tore through both pages really I got through both pages of uh, that were put up in the nest there um, had a good discussion with pronom um, talked to myself for a while but it was good the um, if you have any any comments you would add on these sections or you want to request the mic, feel free, go for it. Um, otherwise, I was going to close out the space because the, um, yeah, I, I got through both pages that I put in the nest, sort of tore through them, and I didn't, I didn't backtrack uh, to any extent that I didn't need to. And then uh, next space, I was saying we have two more pages of Fragment 8 in this version. So we're almost done with Fragment 8. Um, assuming we keep up this pace it would just be one more space on fragment 8 and then I will probably put the cornford fragment um, depending on how fast that's, that next space goes I'll put it in um, in that space and uh, if not at any rate um, by the time we reach the end of fragment 8 I'll put it right there on the end of fragment 8 and then uh, the way of seeming you know, fragment nine through, geez, how long is this thing? It's like fragment uh, 19. So you got 10 fragments after that. But the, um, but I suspect I'll have much less to say about these, um, both because of my own ignorance about ancient science and astrology and the like, and also because it's not the sort of dense argument that we've seen in, um, in fragment eight. I mean, some of these fragments are just... Um, here we go. Fragment 15. Always looking towards the rays of the sun. 
That's from uh, Plutarch on the face of the moon. Okay, well, I'm going to have to um, check the uh, Plutarch on the face of the moon um, because I wonder if that's talking about moonlight being a reflection of the sun or something. So there may be some stuff to discuss, but it's it's not going to be as... Um, it's not really going to be as metaphysically and logically intensive. It's just going to be more interesting trivia. Um, well, there's a few things in here. All right. Well, um, Pranam, I'm, I'm thanking. Well, thank you for uh, speaking up. We had some interesting back and forth there. Ancient, if you want to request the mic, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I will. Uh, I'll close out the space. All right. See everyone later. Thank you.